Welcome back to the Thinking Critical Comic Book Podcast. It's time for Comic Writing 101. Today we're going to be talking about actions and transitions in comic book writing. Might not be exactly what you're thinking. Most people are going to think this is fight scenes. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Now, normally we would have Aaron Sparrow from Darkwing Duck here, but it is his birthday and his friends are taking him out on the town. And apparently it's an all-day celebration. So happy birthday, Aaron Sparrow. If you, if you see him on social media, definitely... I wish him a happy birthday there, but we've got a ringer. We've got another creator that's come on here and is willing to talk about comic book writing. Nader Fox Schaefer, welcome to Thank You Critical. How are you doing? Doing good, Wes. I'm so excited to be here, and, and thanks for having me on, and happy birthday to Aaron. That's, that's... Yeah, happy birthday, Aaron. Yep. Wherever and, you uh, are. If you're unaware, Nader has done some works. He's got seasons. You can see he's got the, the comic set up there. I think it's a, li a novel called Lifeline. He's got an upcoming crowdfunded project called Manchild that we're going to talk about here at the end. So thank you for coming on the channel and, and welcome. And next up is uh, Mark Pellegrini, the man behind, well, what are the men behind? Common America, Black Ops, and some several other projects. How you doing, Mark? I'm doing good. I'm catching up on all the... Uh, notifications on Twitter that I missed while I was hung over. That stuff piles up on me. <laughs> they do, they, they do <laughs> light up. So today we are going to be talking about action. And the big thing to remember are comic books are action. And this is what a, a novel a, a writer said. Jessica Page Morrill lists six delivery modes for fiction writers, action, exposition, description, dialogue, summary, and transition. Obviously, things are a little bit different for comic books. A lot of the exposition is going to be provided via dialogue and, and some reason stuff. So today we're going to talk mostly about action and transition. And comic books are inherently an action medium. Stories are told in static images of single actions, generally speaking, incorporating dialogue, thoughts, and narration. Action doesn't only mean fighting. It's everything your characters do during your story. If your story is not based in action, it probably isn't appropriate to make it a comic book. It's probably more likely a, a prose story or something like that. Um, so what what are your thoughts on that, uh, uh, Nander? Just this thought as, as comic books as an action medium. Oh, uh, did you hear us, Nander? It appears we might not have the greatest signal uh, here. All right, what are your thoughts on that one, Mark? Well, um, I think that for action, uh, you, you can view action not just as, like you said, people punching and kicking each other. Um, if you're writing a romance book, your version of action is the suspense of the tension, you know, like will they, won't they, something romantic happening. If you're doing a horror book, the action is maybe the scary monster popping out and spooking you, or just the tension of the building dread. Um, action is whatever genre you're writing in. The action is just something interesting happening. Um, and that's what you always want to make sure is that your book should not have so much downtime. It should not have valleys that are so deep uh, that the peaks are the um, uh, exception to the rule. Uh, you want to have something interesting going on or you're going to bore your reader um, and you're going to make them stop wanting to read your book. Um, the same thing if you ever watch like an old movie from like, Mystery Science Year 3000, one of those black and white movies, like the killer shrews. We're like, oh boy, there's going to be some killer shrews in this. And it's like <laughs> 45 minutes of characters just like sitting around like uh, a cabin and drinking scotch and not and talking about the killer shrews, but not doing anything. Um, that's what you don't want. Uh, so action is just anything interesting happening to engage your reader. Nader, did you have any thoughts about, you know, comic books as an action medium? Yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, what what Mark said there, you know, really hits it really well. And and I think uh, what makes comic books so uh, unique and exciting is that with each panel and each page, I mean, there's always something that should be happening, or always something that needs to be happening to keep your reader engaged and uh, make them focus on that specific action. Um, with with action in general, I think that. Anytime you have characters that are going through the motions or something's happening within uh, the story that um, it's really important to keep your readers engaged and keep uh, the reader guessing on what's going to happen and how you can pull them along. And some of my favorite, um, you know, 
when it when it comes to using action and using uh, uh, you know layouts in in the way that you can really make a, a scene flow or a page flow is uh, just keeping it to where you know you can have so much going on uh, and at the same time you can be using dialogue and narration to tell a different story while you're showing something too so that's something that's really unique about comic books uh, that uh, it, you know if, if you watch a movie or in any other medium it can be a little jarring if you're trying to simultaneously uh, tell two stories or, or uh, you know make the reader pay attention to two things that are going on but you can do that with comics in a way that you can't do with any other medium absolutely you can uh, overlay a conversation that's providing exposition from two other characters perspective as you're showing the actions of two other characters and you might be getting a, a better perspective of the story and and filling things in, absolutely. Oh, definitely. Uh, I think a, just a great example of that for people who want to study that's, that concept is pick up um, the original Mirage TMNT Volume 1, Number 10. Um, if you can afford it, we actually have a video on <laughs> the price gouging of Ninja Turtles coming up. But um, that's um, a great one of the greatest issues of Ninja Turtles. And I'm actually thinking of Leonardo Number 1, which was the prequel to that one. Yes. Forgive me. Um, Leonardo Number 1. That's the one where the entire issue is a running battle between Leonardo and the Foot Clan, ending with him having to face the Shredder and, and getting his shell kicked in. Um, the entire book is action from page one to the final page. Every single page is action. But at the bottom of each page is a panel showing what the other turtles in April and Splinter are doing back at April's apartments. Um, they're just doing mundane, um, banal stuff, uh, getting ready for Christmas. They're cooking dinner, they're wrapping presents, they're trimming the tree. Stuff that would be boring to the reader, but because it's overlaid um, on the same page with the action of um, Leonardo getting just absolutely wrecked by the Foot Clan, you have this simultaneous picture-in-picture -picture quality of the action and the, you have the peak and the valley on the page at the same time. And as Nander pointed out, that's something very unique to comics that you can't get in other um, visual mediums. And as a comic book writer, um, you should exploit every, um, uh, tool that you have that's unique to your medium, and that's how you create a really special experience like Leonardo number one. Absolutely, and so we'll kind of get into uh, what is action. And it, action is what comic writers use to demonstrate what is happening at any given moment in the story, while dialogue is what brings the, the story and, and characters to life. Uh, the narrative, you know, gives the story its depth and substance. The action actually keeps the story moving. If there's no action, you're kind of stuck in a rut. And how important is it, you know, Nander, to, to have your, your characters in motion to really move your story forward? You don't want people, as, as they're saying in the comment section, sitting at a table eating pizza, explaining everything that's <laughs> happening. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things that uh, you have to really balance. And that's it, uh, you and you can't just use action to, to you know, fill a page count, you know, and, and just to be like, well... You know, I don't have much going on here, so I just need to use action to, you know, uh, hit my quota here and make the issue, you know, feel full or whatever. And so, um, you know, when it when it comes to that and when it comes to making sure that uh, what's happening on the page is, you know, interesting and exciting and uh, keeping your readers engaged, you know, it has to have a lot of weight behind it, too, I think, when it comes to action scenes and uh, not just, you know, yeah, showing characters, uh, you know, sitting around and just talking. Um, and a lot of that can come into play, too, with, you know, how good your artist is, too. And, and there have been uh, times when uh, I'm in my projects, when I'm uh, writing a scene that has to really uh, hit home a lot of emotional beats that doesn't have a lot going on necessarily, you know, visually, but you're having these characters have these, you know, really important dialogue scenes. And the way that a page is laid out and the way that you uh, are able to collaborate with your artist and making sure that w whatever you're showing there is interesting. And I think that's where layouts can really play a big part in it and, and having uh, what could be a boring scene um, actually be really cool and really fun to look at and really fun to read as you go from you know the top to the bottom. And I think that is one of the best things that you can do if you're a writer and you're wondering how can I, you know, keep this interesting, work with the artist to uh, incorporate uh, different, you know, 
payouts in, in ways that you can uh, keep things flowing uh, in a natural way, but uh, not have it just be two people staring at each other, you know, or have it feel like two people are just staring at each other talking. Yeah, so talking Mark, heads, those are boring. <laughs> you might be in a position yeah, where you kind of right. need talking heads to provide your exposition, right, Mark? Yeah, and right, so right. But that's um, – things that you can do, right? Uh, yep, so the strategy that, that Tim and I came up with um, is that if you, ha you have to have dialogue pages um, – they're, they're a necessary evil and not even that. You have to have exposition as well. It's, it all comes down to the execution of it. Um, how do you seed mm -hmm. it into the dialogue? How do you seed it into the plot? How do you seed it into the action? And you do ha you can't have peaks without valleys, so you do have to have the downtime in between your action sequences. Uh, but what I try to do is if I have a page in my, uh, my page breakdowns, my layouts for the script, um, that's like, uh, tension at um, the Vander's homestead. I'm writing Common America. Um, and then I have like uh, my summary of what's happening on these four pages. And I've already um, you know, broken it down. Like this is going to be a four page sequence. And these are the kinds of conversations that the characters are going to have. This is how their plot relevant. Um, this is the kind of exposition they're going to drop. And then it's up to me when I'm scripting how I'm going to implement those things. But one of the rules that um, I came up with and that um, Tim agrees with me on is always have the characters doing something in the panel while they're talking. Um, it can be something like picking up a trunk by the handle and carrying it, or it can be um, just some visual humor going on in the background. Like we have this character named Badger, who's, who's a capybara um, named after um, and the character Badger, but he's a capybara. We can have the capybara doing something in the background. Like maybe he's tugging on, like he's chewing on, on a dress and she's like tug of warring it with him. But as she's giving her conversation, as she's talking, uh, Carly, I mean, the characters are doing something. Um, it's more fun for Tim to draw. It gives him more um, variety as an artist. Um, it makes the pages um, just more engaging as a reader to, to read and, and watch stuff happening as these characters are talking. Um, but it also, it, it eliminates, I, I know for Tim anyway, um, for your artist, the difficulty of trying to find new ways to draw talking heads. Um, and there's only so many ways you can do that. And even the most skilled artist, if they've got to draw nothing but these talking heads um, back and forth, they're going to run out of ways and different angles and expressions to do that. And if your artist is bored, your reader is going to be really bored. Uh, so if you give instructions in your script on just having the characters do something while they're talking, um, that gives the artist um, something more playful to do. And then that, that will uh, transcend onto the reader and the reader will have a better time. Absolutely. There's other things you can do. You can, uh, during the exposition, you can show examples of what they're talking about. If there was a fight and they're talking about two people fighting, you could actually show that you could have their, their dialogue boxes going up like Nander was talking about earlier, where you can show different sequences and overlap them and really utilize the medium and not be so stale. Cause when you get those nine panel grids like in Heroes in Crisis and it's just Wally West talking and be looking sad, it gets really boring really quick. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and sometimes like Tim will, I mean, he's the, the artist on all of our books and he'll come in and save the day. He'll read my script. And even though I do write actions, he'll come up with something better and something um, less... Uh, I don't know, you, you can have the characters doing something in real time, or you can do something a bit more uh, creative. And sometimes he'll come up with a visual that, um, you know, I'm the writer, not the artist. So he came up with a visual that really improved upon what I had in the script. It was in um, Black Ops 3. Uh, we have a scene where um, uh, Penelope is, is talking about uh, this castle that they have to invade because they have to extract Misha from it and get her out. And the villains all um, they have to lay siege to this castle covertly. Um, in the script, I have her describing, you know, what their mission is going to be um, and how they're going to infiltrate the castle, get their objective and get back out. Um, what Tim did that was really cool was he did a throwback to the map screen from Castlevania and he put that in the background and he showed like the diagram, the layout of how they're going to get into the castle, the rooms they got to go through and how they're going to get back out. And like, that's really cool. That's a really um, interesting visual way to get that information apart to the reader. That's yes, it's exposition, but it's a fun form of exposition. It's visually engaging. Um, and it's just, it's not boring. 
Um, it's not necessarily action in the sense of action, like you said, it's, it's not people punching and kicking, but it is visually stimulating. And any form of stimulation um, in your art, you can view as action. Absolutely. So let's kind of get into the types of action that we can kind of have. I'm sorry, that's not what we're doing, fight scenes. That's what we were going towards. My <laughs> bad. Fight scenes are used to engage readers. You know, readers shouldn't only want to see what's happening. They need to kind of feel it during your fight scene. So, you, you know, you want to have your sound effects. You want to have blood splatter. You want it to be really engaging. You want to keep your focus, concentrate on the most important elements of your fight. Uh, be creative. Use your character's powers in new and imaginative ways. Uh, make your hero work. Protagonists should should have to react to unforeseen circumstances and, and adapt and incorporate dialogue and thoughts during the fight scene. A fun catchphrase could add a cool factor uh, to the character in the scene. And definitely keep it short. You don't want 20 pages of, of a straight fighting scene. It'll get boring. Except in a few circumstances, obviously you talked about one of them earlier, Mark, where it was being kind of overlaid with a, a conversation that was going on the bottom. There was a silent issue of Ninja, Ninja K, where it's essentially one enormous fight scene. But it was extremely dramatic, and it was uh, it was not normal. It felt like uh, important. Yeah, I mean, if if every issue was like that, um, it wouldn't be special. It's like the silent issue of GI Joe, which is just one big um, action sequence. It's Snake Eyes infiltrating um, Castle Destro to rescue uh, Scarlet and get back out again, and without any line of dialogue being written whatsoever. But it was very meticulously laid out and drawn. And it's um, it's the reason why they use that issue of GI Joe um, in uh, artists and writing classes for how to read comics because it's such um, a, a great piece of work, but it still has all the hallmarks of a scripted um, written narrative within comics. It, it still has the exposition. It's all just more interpretive. Um, it still has all the weight and the plots and the character beats. You just have to um, discern it from the art itself and not through any of the writing. Um, but again, that's almost like the silent issue of G.I. Joe is, is a special issue because, you know, there's 150 other issues that all have talking in them. Yeah. Uh, Nader, I'm just certain that you've, you've probably read like some of the Golden and Silver Age DC comics, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than reading one of those Superman comics because when he finally goes to confront the villain in the end, he beats him in the same exact way every single issue in about three pages. <laughs> yeah. You want to provide a little bit of f f variety to your fight scene. You know, let the villa do something that catches the hero off guard and let him react to it and, you know, think on his feet a little bit. Yeah, I mean, for, for sure. It, it's, uh, you never want to, uh, the best fight scenes are the ones that are earned, you know, the ones that where you, you get to that point and the reader's finally excited to see, you know, these two characters clash or however many characters clash. And, it, you know, it's not the longest, you know, fight scene, or, but it doesn't end just like that. And where you're like, oh, well, that wasn't really worth it because we've been building up, you know, to this to this moment all this time. And uh, you can't just, you know, get to it and then cut it and be like, you know, that's that's just not a that's not a fun, exciting way to, uh, you know, have these two characters meet. And and some of the best um, fight scenes in comics and in any, you know, storytelling are the ones that not only are really, you know, visually exciting to see, but also, um, you know, emotionally exciting. And like you're saying with really feeling the action, you know, the reason why we love seeing, uh, you know, professor X uh, against Magneto is there's so much history behind there, you know, so much history between those characters and what they've been through. And same with, you know, all the, all the greats of, you know, cap and red skull and, and the FF and Dr. Doom and Superman and Lex Luthor and Spider-Man and green goblin. I mean, all those characters and, heroes versus villains, there's a personal and emotional weight to when you get to those moments. And uh, you can't just cut those short. You really have to reward the reader for following and for wanting to get to that point. Absolutely. I was, there was a Nightwing story. And it's called, uh, it's the, the villain's called The Judge. It is a great, it's like five issues and you finally get up here and you've seen Nightwing lose twice. And he's yeah. getting up to The Judge. I think it's called... Um, the untouchable. And he finally gets to the final sequence and nothing changes in the fight. It's still enjoyable because the whole story was good. But in that final fight, he just wins that time. I was like, what did he right. learn along the way to where he was able to overcome <laughs> the, 
the, the judge did the same things that he did last time, and, and it just didn't work now. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. So um, Aaron Sparrow is not here with us today, uh, but he's here in spirit uh, because <laughs> he taught – this is something I learned from Aaron that Aaron um, always has to remind me that he learned from Tad Stones, the creator of Rescue Rangers and Darkwing Duck. Um, he calls it page seven action. Um, if you're writing your, your comic script – and nothing interesting has happened by page seven, then you need to start over um, because <laughs> that, that's that's a boring comic. Um, if you open your book up with too much exposition, too much dialogue, if you open it up on a valley that's just way too deep, it's just going on and on and on, and you're by page seven and no action has happened yet, then your comic's boring. And when I when we do our comics, we don't we obviously we don't do the twenty page monthly. As Common America and Black Ops um, are sixty page books. So we had a lot of real estate. We were basically publishing a graphic novel. Um, so I break when I do my scripting on those, I break them up into a three act structure and I always make sure that there's an action sequence in each act, but it's always um, escalating. So we'll open up with an action sequence um, uh, within the first seven pages, usually by page five, or just, and it can be a short one. Um, your act one action sequence, you know, that should be like your your sampler, your appetizer. You open up on maybe an in medias res. It's kind of one of the easiest ways to do. It's a shortcut I have to try and stop myself from doing, but it's the easiest way to jump into the action at the start of your book. But it's still, you're, you're opening up with something exciting and stimulating happening. It can only be two or three pages, but it's uh, out the gate. You have some action in your book that hooks your reader. Your act two uh, fight scene should be a little bit bigger. Um, uh, to show the escalation of stakes, and, and maybe that that's where the characters, you know, they they win in Act One, they lose in Act Two, and they rally in Act Three. You know, that that's uh, uh, an old standby, but you know it works that way. And then your your big uh, bombastic action scene in Act Three, your your climax, your closure should be that should be the big one. You're working your way up to that. Uh, I, the reason I bring this up um, to make sure that when you're scripting action scenes to escalate them um, is because if you don't, you end up with something like a Michael Bay Transformers movie where like <laughs> it, it's the middle of the movie and you're still sitting through like a half hour of just robots punching this huge action sequences and buildings getting knocked over and explosions here and everywhere. And and the sun has been setting for the past two hours. Why won't it set already? Um, and it just, it just goes on and on and on. Man and, of Steel. Yeah, Man of Steel was like, holy God. I remember after he destroys those whatever d doomsday devices are and he still has to fight Zod. I'm like, oh my God, the movie's not over yet. Like the action <laughs> wasn't stimulating anymore. I got bored with it from overstimulation. It was just something that went on too long and even action can get boring when it goes on too long. Um, you have to make sure that if you're going to have a huge, big action sequence, save it for the ending and build your way up to it. Don't have, you know, a 20 page action sequence in the middle. And then at the end, you know, you've even if you have another 20 page action sequence, your your reader's going to get bored with it because they've already sat through a really huge battle. You want to try and build them up to it um, so they don't get bored, even when exciting stuff is happening. And yeah, uh, and I mean, we, when. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. No. And like when um, when you're doing that, you know, the reason why you want to escalate is because you've seen your hero go through, you know, this this one skirmish and then you you want them to fight an even, you know, tougher one later, because if it's if it's not as exciting as the first one, then you're like, wait a second. Why couldn't you beat this guy? But he beat you know, this guy and, and it wasn't yep. that, ex you know, it, it doesn't make sense with the character. And and uh, also I wanted to point out that uh when when you're approaching action sequences, uh, you know I love I really love to start out strong, you know, and, and it's it's a very uh, Stanley Jack Kirby way to do it. But like, you know, start out with an action scene, you know, with you know a splash page or like on your first page of your comic when you open an issue, like show just show it and like display it, and uh, you know splash pages are a great way, and it could be a single or a double. Uh, where it's a great way to bookend your action sequences. So, you know, you can you can have that final punch be you know a two page splash, which I've done in, in some of my stories because it gives that finality to it and that that sense of reward and like um, just overall scope and epicness that you can add to it. 
So kind of going on with what you were just talking there, a great transition. There's a, a question from that was a, a cool trick. Which is better, adding blur and smear frames to show movement in a fight or making making the character still and giving them tons of detail? Now, if you're trying to show like impact, like full-on impact, you're going to want kind of the character still and show that detail of Superman punching Doomsday in the face and his teeth yeah. flying out. You know what I mean? But if you're wanting to show how dynamic this fight is and how fast it is, you're probably going to want the blur. So you might need both. Yeah, I would break it up. I mean, the something I would do is, yeah, when you're when you're when you're doing that, uh, some one of the best ways to do that, you know, is have a seven to eight panel page where uh, you're showing speed in one, and then you're showing detail in the next, and you kind of alternate between there, so you get the best of both worlds. Um, it really depends on you know the kind of character you're working with too, um, and I, I really like the highly detailed action scenes where you really. Uh, feel it and you don't even have to have uh, sound effects on there sometimes you can just you know show that punch you know enter enter the gut of that other character and uh, it's just that's all you need and you can you can see the wear and tear that your characters are going through that's also another another thing to keep in mind when you're having a big you know fight scene uh, be sure to show like some collateral damage uh, or at least with you know the person's costume, the character's costume, and and show it you know get tattered and and torn and all that good stuff. But um, but yeah, I think uh, depending on what your character can do and what you want to show, I mean it's it's more exciting to see Superman you know punch Doomsday and see all all of that detail than just see him you know as a blur you know just like you see a red blur like go through the panel and you're like whoa like what happened you know. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, there's not, nothing better than the, the knockout punch, though. I want to see Guy Gardner eating it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, totally. <laughs> That's one of the the most satisfying uh, pages in any comic book because Guy Gardner really had that coming. <laughs> the one punch. Um, and I, I uh, just to go off topic, I hate it when people um, keep redoing that scene. We we just had a, a show, Wes, where we talked about. Um, recycling ideas and rebooting things. And uh, I think there should be a law that no one can ever do a parody or a satire or a reboot of the one punch scene ever again, <laughs> because it's just been done so many times. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's like um, Nander makes a good point. You don't want to do everything the same way every time, because even if you're having action, then that's going to get boring or predictable at the very least. Um, you want to mix it up. When uh, when we did, so Black Ops 2, we introduced this character named Patriotter, who's um, who's an otter that's um, uh, radioactively enhanced and works as a, a commando for the U.S. government. Um, but we we uh, added some variation to our action sequences. So we showed what Patriotter can do. Um, he's very quick. And so he has the, these action sequences where he's, he's mowing down the enemy soldiers and he's just bouncing all over the place and he's going feral and going wild. So we showed what he can do. But then later, um, when he's got to kill some more enemy soldiers, instead of taking up a whole bunch of real estate, a whole bunch of pages to show the reader stuff that they already know he can do, it's a page turn. And on the next page, it's the soldiers rounding a corner or opening a door, rather, and just seeing Patriotter standing amongst a pile of other dead soldiers that he killed off, off screen, off panel. Um, so we know that Patriotter killed all those guys. And it's a really exciting, scary moment. Um, we didn't have to show it though, because we already showed him killing soldiers earlier in the book. Um, we, as long as it's not a major a character, you can do it. Yeah, all exactly. Um, and we did something similar in uh, in Black Ops Three that uh, sometimes you can segue in and out of your action with transitions um, and get the point across without having to show it. And I know people's like, "Oh, comics show don't tell." Well, as long as you show enough action. Um, sometimes you can tell, break it up, you know, break up the monotony. So Patriotter is using this character named Rigor Tortoise um, that he carries around as a backpack and uses like a flying guillotine on a chain. And we already showed him killing a whole bunch of soldiers using Rigor Tortoise as a flying guillotine. So we transition out of that um, with this really excellent um, splash page that Tim drew where the um, spinning blade of Rigor Tortoise is at the top of the page and um, it's transitioning as your eye moves down the page and turning into the spinning chopper blades of the helicopter. And then you see um, Patriotter and Rick or Tortoise being airlifted up out of the battlefield in that chopper. And it's a way of visually imparting to the audience the action that happened, that um, Patriotter slaughtered everybody, and now he's getting away in the, the chopper. Uh, 
but we didn't have to tell them that. They can just look at the art and they can um, visualize it for themselves and they can put two and two together. Um, you can do fun things like that, uh, especially if you're low on, on uh, real estate on page space and you don't have room to do like another five page sequence of the characters fighting. You can do something like that that might even be more engaging or more exciting. Nader, are, are you back with us? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, sometimes you, you have to turn the camera off. We've also got Common Sense here. He wants to know uh, how to make a balance of action because I want my villain to win and my heroes to actually lose from time to time. I, I don't want the heroes to be end up being overpowered. Uh, can that, that can be considered bad writing. Should the heroes lose every once in a while? I think so. Yeah, otherwise there really aren't any stakes. Now, you want to um, you want to have a balance, like you said. Uh, what we do, with uh, especially with Black Ops, is that we're trying to build up these villains that we've got. We're on uh, Volume 4 of Black Ops, which is um, Black Ops X Common America. And we're building up our villain team called uh, Cryptic, um, who's got this leader named Apex Moth. Um, we want the heroes to win because we want our heroes to be competent. They can't just be losers who fail all the time. Otherwise, the readers aren't going to like them. Uh, but we also don't want the villains to lose all the time because then they don't have a threat and there's no suspense or tension in the book if you just know they're going to lose all the time. So one of the things that we implement is we kind of implement um, like a 50-50. Uh, the villains will get some of what they want. Um, the heroes will stop the larger threats. Um, in Black Ops 2, Cryptic is going to release um, a bunch of chupacabras on New York um, if uh, their leader, Apex Moth, isn't released from custody. So um, the Black Ops team, USAGI, Patrioter, Penelope, all them, they stop the Chupacabras from wreaking havoc on New York, but uh, Apex Moth gets away. So the bad guys got something out of it. The good guys got something out of it. Um, uh, neither side's a complete loser. Neither side's a complete winner. Um, and then we, we do similar things like that, where the villains... Uh, like Xanatos from uh, Gargoyles, he's always got you know that that 4D chess thing going on. Where sometimes he he'll take he'll sacrifice a pawn if he in the long game he's going to take the queen, you know, or take the king rather. Uh, if you think about it like that, then the heroes their victory isn't a, a solid complete victory. You know, the uh, the villains um, are still working towards a larger goal and getting something out of it. Nader, do you have any thoughts of, of uh, allowing the villains to win, kind of building them up that way that when the, the hero finally comes back, it's that more much more satisfying? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's one of those things where when you're uh, writing a villain and, and a hero and their interactions together, you really have to uh, make sure that when the hero goes up against that villain, you know, you, you, you know what you're dealing with and you actually are as much as you can put the reader in suspension of like, wait, can he actually beat him or like, will he actually win? I mean, that's, those are the best type of fights because um, you never want to just be like, well, yeah, he's just, I mean, it, it's really interesting because, you know, we love our heroes and we're like, well, of course they're going to win. But uh, it, you know, the fact that we know that it, it doesn't mean we can just rest on on that. You know, it's like we have to make sure that whatever they're going through and, and the people that they're facing and the villains that they're facing really put up a good fight. And and maybe they will lose. And that's something that you have to uh, keep in mind. And you have to make your reader go, oh, whoa, like, I actually don't know. You know, he's this powerful, but is he actually going to win? Uh, you got to get that back and forth with with the interactions with the, with the villains and the heroes. And, um, you know, we always want our heroes to win and we root for our heroes and most of the time they do, but when they don't, that just makes it all the more intense and, uh, makes you want to keep reading. Absolutely. So we're going to transition from fight scenes over to, uh, transitions themselves. Let's talk about some of the types of transitions. I think when people think of transitioning, they're, they're thinking of, moving from one scene to another, maybe moving locations. So you want your, your establishing shot and all that. But technically, you know, the an entire comic, comic book is just a, a never ending set of transitions. And there are many yeah. types of them, Mark. Uh, we've got the movement to movement, basically uh, a person unbuttoning their shirt. And you see, I open button them up top one. And then the next scene is, is the next one. You know, you don't yeah. get that all that often. Action to action. And that is the subject progressing through like a specific set of movements, maybe traveling through the house, scene yeah. to scene. That's when we're going to start moving from one physical location to another one. 
and transitioning to another part of the story. Aspect to aspect, that's going to be when uh, maybe at the exact same time you see that the alarm's going off as they're they're accidentally chopping their finger off and the husband's in the shower or something. Yeah. That one's a kind of a different type of transition. And then you have non sequitur where, where essentially nothing makes sense. Uh, the action to action <laughs> transitions are the most common in all of Kaba books, uh, with the next being the scene to scene and the subject to subject transitions. The moment to moment and the non sequitur aspect to aspect uh, transitions are, are much more uncommon or much less common. Uh, Nader, what do you think about transitioning? Obviously, when you're doing a comic book, it's all it's static images, but it has to flow correctly. Do you try to, to use different scene transitions or types of transitions during your story to, so it doesn't get mundane? Yes. Uh, that's probably one of the trickiest things to do when you're doing a comic because, you know, uh, right off the bat, when, when a reader opens the page, you know, you're, they're getting hit with all these visuals and you don't want to have every single panel necessarily look alike or if it's in the same room um, you want to or the same building you know you want to you want to change up how you're approaching the angles of that room or building and the the type of transitions that you want to you know move move forward with um, you know one of one of the best ways to do transitions from I believe you know from long distances of course is that typical and, and it works, you know, it's a good way to do it, but it's that typical way of, you know, having dialogue, have a, have an overlay of a dialogue box that um, is on the present scene and it, your transition to the next panel is, you know, that character talking in a different time and place. And that's something that you see a lot at the end of, you know, uh, a page and you, you do the page turn and then you're in a whole different place. And that, that's some of the best ways to do a transition uh, is our, our page turns because that way you don't have to necessarily uh, you know hold the hand of the reader so much so that they know where they are. What you're actually doing is by them actually turning the page, it's it's a way of going we're we're changing the scene or we can change the scene without holding your hand too much. Yeah, page turns are your most valuable currency. I think when you're doing a script, uh, you always want to keep. Um, track of them because the way comics yeah. are, it's um, even numbers on the left, uh, odd numbers on the right. So if you're um, plotting out your script, if you're um, you know doing your page breakdowns, if you have a, a shocking uh, reveal scene, you want to put that on an even page because that utilizes the page turn. You know, they turn the page and then uh, big shocker, they see like an explosion or they see a pile of dead bodies. Um, it's it's a tactile requirement of reading a comic that um, requires the reader's physical engagement. Um, and it also works like the way a transition wipe would in a movie where, you know, it's, it's yeah. taking you from one place to another. It's um, It requires a second or two for you to do it, to you perform the function. And it builds that, that suspense for just a little second. Um, I, rem it's, I remember reading scary stories to tell in the dark as a little kid, and that has all those beautiful Steve Gamel drawings in them. And it, it's not a comic, it's a, it's a book, but it's fully illustrated. And I just remember being so scared when I had to turn the page because I didn't know what kind of drawing Stephen Gamel is going to have on the next page. Um, and so it, it built so much suspense reading those scary stories, the actual text of them, the prose, and, not, and having to work up the courage to turn the page and see the scary drawing on the next page, what, what it's going to be. Um, and you can utilize that too in comics when you're um, building up your, your transitions. Um, one thing that um, Aaron and I um, agree on that we've talked about um, before on the show is you want to avoid having a transition in the middle of the page um, because that comes off as sloppy and also disorienting to the reader because you have to... Um, you have to establish where they are um, now, where the characters are, if they're moving from place to place um, in the middle of the page. And it breaks up the action and the flow of the page to have them you know, go from point A to point B mid page. Uh, a lot of yeah. times um, writers will have to do that uh, because they've um, the way they've plotted the book, they've run out of real estate and they just don't have, um, they got to fit it all in 20 pages or 22 pages and, and you know, it's a necessary evil. But when you're in the plotting phase of your book, you should try to avoid that as much as possible. So what do you think about, Mark, when you have like a, a transition, you're transitioning from one character to another character, they're they're interacting, but they're not like physically like right in front of each other. Like 
maybe the one guy is throwing an object and you see it travel from his panel to like into that panel. Do you think that's an effective transition? I always think those are pretty dope. I think it is. Um, now, a lot of that comes down to uh, uh, the execution of the artist. Um, but if I'm putting something like that, uh, you know, in the script, I'll on my panel description, I'll, I'll try and make it as clear as possible in the in the text of it for Tim or whoever's drawing the book. Um, you just want to make sure that your um, uh, your spatial reasoning is coherent. Um, if you're doing something like that, um, if a character is throwing, uh, you know, a, a shuriken, a ninja star, or something, or a dart. Um, in their panel, and then in the next panel, um, their target is dodging it, and it's like hitting the wall behind them, or you know, whatever. You just want to make sure that that change of perspectives is coherently telegraphed uh, from panel to panel. Um, it doesn't look like they're uh, in two different rooms, in two different places, or if the uh, if the uh, dart is, is flying on from on the right side of the panel and then it's landing in the next panel, then it's gotta be on the left because the perspective's um, switched. I remember there was um, it's an issue of the Dreamwave Ninja Turtles comic that was uh, drawn by LaShawn Thomas. And this was like one of his earliest uh, um, published work. And he had a really hard time with um, the whole spatial components of panel to panel transitions. Uh, Casey Jones would get kicked by Raphael and when he goes flying in the air in one panel, his golf bag is on his left shoulder. And when he lands in the next panel, his golf bag is on his right shoulder. You know, things like that. Um, <laughs> the, just trying to, to track the character and where they are and what they're doing um, from panel to panel would be really difficult because the transitions would be so incoherent. Um, and I know LaShawn got better. I think he works in the animation now instead of comics. But uh, those early... They have very amateurish feel, those, those Dreamwave Ninja Turtle comics, uh, just because the artist hadn't quite mastered um, spatial uh, reasoning from panel to panel transitions, and it ended up making a very um, awkward comic that's hard to follow. Yeah, there's nothing worse than looking at a panel and you're like, what is this? So like, <laughs> how did this happen? I don't get – is he upside down? Like, I don't, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> So yeah. Uh, yeah, bigger, the continuity continuity is so important. Yeah, when it comes to it comes to that and and the way you're telling the scene. I don't want to be that guy that brings up Watchmen like all the time, but uh one of my favorite um learning experiences about writing comics and just being completely mind blown by how you can um use time and space and transitions in comics uh is uh, issue 4, you know, the Dr. Manhattan origin issue because what you're getting is you're getting someone's narration in, in the present tense, so to speak, but you're seeing the past and the future and the present all at the same time. And they're all uh, uh, alternating. You know, there, there's so many uh, moments in that issue where you're getting different scenes and you're, you're going from the present day to the past, to the future and simultaneously on one page. And I remember reading that and just having a complete, completely like different way of looking at how comics can be, can be scripted and, and, and told. Guys, can you continue on with this? I have been summoned by the wife to get the baby a bill. I'll be right back. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, you, you bring up Watchmen and uh, I've given it, given it a hard time on the show in the past. Yeah. Just because, yeah. You know, it's, um, it is a, well, great... everyone, everyone talks about it. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. just like, yeah, I mean, it's a great but book. This... Um, I think just uh, so many people look to it as like the handbook on how to make a comic instead of a right, handbook right. on how to make a comic. So we, we exactly. kind of, yeah. yeah, we get too many flavors of Watchmen um, these days. And it's like, all right, well, oh, so the, the bad man, the bad guy did it, but he did it 45 minutes ago. Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> we've seen that before. How many times? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's that that goes back to the idea of recycling things and and you know doing that like it's not, you know, it's cool for what it was then, you know, not everyone needs to do that now. And that's something that I think a lot of people get mistaken on. And and that's why I was like, I don't know if I should bring this up, but I just remember uh reading that the first time I read it and thinking um what an interesting way to tell a single issue to tell someone's basically life story but showing it, you know, from, from different points in time and all of that is, it's, it's a, it's a great place to start. And then mm -hmm. it's, it's your job as a writer to, you know, potentially do it better if you can, or at least take what you love about that 
and then make it your own. And that's something that you right. really have to pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, books like Watchmen, uh, they're deconstructionist. And while that's really good as a learning tool because it's deconstruction, you're basically seeing, you know, the uh, the blueprint behind how the comic is made and it's poking holes yeah. in um, the cliches, the subconscious cliches of comic book storytelling that we maybe take for granted or don't realize um, are done so much. Um, but if you're trying to write a sincere and authentic book, um, you're not writing a deconstruction um, because uh, by its very nature, a deconstruction is basically tearing that story down, tearing the conventions yeah. of the storytelling down. Um, and so many people read Watchmen and they want like, oh, I want to write my own Watchmen. Like, well, you can't really <laughs> yeah. write a deconstruction until you've constructed a story yourself at least once. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's why I actually uh, really enjoyed um, – what as much as what he did, what what Johns did with Doomsday Clock is, I felt like it was a great way to reconstruct what had been supposedly broken or or you know taken down, and um, the idea of like bringing back the JSA and these heroes of old that we haven't had in a very very long time, and you know gi giving hope and in, back into uh, DC continuity so to speak, but. Um, but yeah, like uh, I think I think Watchmen is a great way to start somewhere, but only to you know read read more stuff. There's you know there's, <laughs> yeah, there's a right. lot of better you know there's a lot there's a lot of stuff. But but when when uh, if if you're wondering about transitions, I, I really like looking at that issue. Oh yeah, I mean so. It's, it is, feels like an experimental book, um, but it's like what I was talking yeah. about, uh, the G.I. Joe silent issue. That issue is special because um, it's the only one like that in that run. Um, and same thing like Watchmen is that it's uh, the Rorschach origin story where when the first time I read it, I, had, I did not notice that um, the panel layouts were done like a symmetrical Rorschach test until someone told me. And then I went back and I, I looked at the issue and like, oh, holy crap. Uh, Dave Gibbons put a lot of effort <laughs> it at all. Um, but I, I go back and I see that and I really appreciate, you know, how much work and effort went into that, something that was subliminal that, you know, the reader wouldn't have even picked up on, um, you know, their first read through, but it's there um, looking you square in the face. Uh, so yeah. like that is having fun with comics as the medium of comics. And that is something I do respect a lot about Watchmen is it does the utmost with the comic book storytelling medium that you can't do as we found out with movies with the Watchmen movie or TV shows with the Watchmen TV. <laughs> yeah, th those gimmicks just they're made strictly for comics and there's something you can only do with comics and that makes the medium special. Yeah, I totally. Know. I think oh, oh yeah. uh, I just wanted to say, you know, going back to the idea of of, of the silent issue, you know, of that GI Joe issue, um I think writers should really pay attention to silent issues. It's really kind of funny to think about, but if uh, if you're wanting to script a comic, because I, I remember the first silent issue I, I read, it was actually um, uh, the issue after Johnny Storm died in Jonathan Hickman's run. Um, it's a it's an oversized silent issue of all of the Fantastic Four members um, mourning. And I remember reading that, and there's, there's a part of my head that's going... Uh, Oh, I feel gypped. Like there's not a lot of writing. You know, there's no writing in here. Like, like I'm I'm paying like four or five dollars for this oversized issue, but there's no writing. And then, but the the other writer like part of my brain is going, whoa! Like, how can you do this? And and how can it how can it be as interesting as it was? Because it was an amazing issue, and it was a great way to tell a story without having dialogue. And I think the final page had some dialogue, and it was a really great final page. Um, and so. I think writers should definitely look at silent issues as a way to go, you know, how can I implement what I see here and try to use it in my own stories? Because you're really getting sort of another blueprint there that you can draw from. Yeah, I, I just want to point that out to all the writer haters out there when it comes to comics, is that if you only view um, what the writer's contribution is based on how much text is in the book, you're only seeing about 10% of what the writer actually yeah. wrote. <laughs> yeah. You're not seeing um, all the, the plotting work that we have to do, the research we have to do. And then the actual scripts that we write and give um, to the artist, you know, has panel breakdowns and page breakdowns. And we describe everything and we include reference material. And, and you don't see any of that as the reader. Um, <laughs> but all that goes towards building the comic. Um, you know, once we collaborate with the artist and make sure it comes out as organically as possible. But you only see about 10% of our actual written words. <laughs> All right, fellas, yeah. do you feel like you fully covered <laughs> transitions? 
I think so. All right, yeah. Andrew, you've got a project coming out. It's going to be out on it's Kickstarter, right? That's right. Yeah, August second. It's called Manchild. What's what's going on with that? <laughs> uh, so yeah, Manchild is uh, one of the most exciting things that I've been able to put my time into and, and my 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 love for comics into and. I don't think I've been this excited about something I've written in a, in a while. Um, but I, uh, the series is an homage to Silver Age, Marvel Age of Comics, and uh, is also a part commentary on comic book fandom and how comics have changed in the last you know, 80 years, 70, 80 years, and the idea of what a hero is and how that, that's changed uh, based on the way culture has shifted and, and how we look at the black and white and the gray areas of, of of comics and, and heroism and all that. But uh, it uh, the idea really stemmed from after Stan Lee passed away, it was one of those things where um, it it hit me harder than I actually thought it would. And, you know, I mean, it was one of, it, it's just growing up and seeing someone like Stan Lee, seeing someone so charismatic and, and excited about comics and someone who had given me so much, you know, in, 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 uh, inspirations and characters and, and also, you know, him along with Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and all those people that, you know, created uh, pop culture basically as we know it. Uh, and I was like, you know, I want to, I want to give back. And that's really where this project came from was I wanted to give back and kind of do a, a tribute book to, uh, to Stan Lee and to his work and, and the Marvel age of comics. And so for the last, I'd probably say a year or two, I've just been, drenched in in silver age books and reading uh all the old stuff and having a new appreciation for uh for the silver age but um it uh tells two stories and uh one story takes place uh in my own sort of silver age constructed universe with a character called the monarch crier uh and fighting professor pilgrim and it, it has this very it, it's written in the silver age style so there's there's so many exclamation points. There's so many, uh, uh, you know, exposition when it comes to the way that Stanley would write uh, in in looking at the best Are we parts getting of that. Pros? How, how you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, it's 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 uh, looking at all the all the just the excitement that were that was in those issues and and looking back and and appreciating that and. And how much you know it's changed, uh, and so that's that's where uh, it takes place. One story there, and then uh, there's also another story simultaneously. The series tells two stories where uh, we're in the present day with uh, a comic book fan, a super comic book fan named Rufus Boston, and he's this overweight uh, virgin. Uh, he's in his 30s, lives in his parents' basement. You know, not not much going for him at all, but. He has his head in, in comics, and he's a dreamer. He's someone who uh, just loves storytelling in, in comics. And so you see um, the juxtaposition of uh, what it means to be uh, a, a, a man, uh, and but being a kid at heart, and the, the pitfalls of that, and also the the beauty in it too. Uh, that's something I really wanted to explore with the series. So that's why it's called Man Child. It's kind of taking that word and putting it on trial. And going, you know, uh, you know, this is so derogatory when you call people, you know, a man baby or a man child. Um, but then we're told, you know, be a kid at heart. So I wanted to look at that and see what I can play, play with that. And that's what the series is about. Very exciting stuff. Uh, who, who's going to be the artist? Are you, you're the writer. Yeah, I'm the writer. I'm the creator and writer. Uh, I work with, uh, Jay Mazar. He's, uh, he's a terrific artist. He's, uh, doing you know pencils inks and colors uh and i'm working with a letterer dc hopkins um he's done some image books he's lettered some some really great stuff uh also what's really great this is the first time i've been able to work with some marvel dc and image comics artists they're contributing uh variant covers to the first issue and uh one of them uh is uh, uh welby who worked on marvel's x with jim Kruger and alex ross uh another one is uh tom riley who worked on uh Immortal Hulk, uh, and also um, Marvel Snapshots X-Men, and then the Eisner Award-winning artist Tony Harris, who worked on Starman in the 90s, and Ex Machina with Brian K. Vaughn. Um, so some really amazing talent, and really 
great scores that I didn't know I'd be able to, you know, to work with these people that I've admired for uh, some for a very, very long time um, and some really beautiful work uh, that, you know, I'm just completely blown away by. Well, sounds very exciting. So is this going to be issue one of, is it an ongoing? Or is it yeah, it's a, a, it's, a limited, it's a limited series. It's going to be six issues. Uh, and this will be uh, the Kickstarter campaign for the first issue. Very nice. What do you think about that, Mark? Does that sound exciting? It does. I also liked um, that contradiction you pointed out that uh, everybody says, oh, don't be a man, baby. Don't be a man child. Be a child at heart. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. yeah. People are jerks. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, it's uh, it's two conflicting messages, and it's something that uh, I think a lot of people struggle with. And and I've seen just in my own experience, I don't know how many times I've met people who have said, you know, when I when I went went to college, you know, I gave up comics, or when I met my girlfriend, I gave up comics, or when I, you know, it's it's like when they hit a hit a threshold or, or this this point of growing up, it's like they gave up their childhood or, or part of their childhood because it just wasn't you know cool. But like now everything's cool, you know, it's like, oh, it's cool to like, you know, Marvel movies and Star Wars and all these things. But it's like, you know what? It actually wasn't cool for a really long time. <laughs> so <laughs> right. uh, I want, yeah, I wanted to to look at that and be like, what happened? And, and like, why is this all of a sudden, you know, everyone's just, you know, a fan of comics and or say they're a fan of comics and love these, you know, superheroes and for the longest time, you know, it just wasn't really accepted. And um, I've always been fascinated with the idea of grown men, you know, writing children's stories and that idea of, you know, Stan Lee in his like late thirties and Jack Kirby in his forties doing these books for kids. And, um, you know, and, and they felt like, you know, Stan Lee wanted to write the great American novel. And there's a part of him that always felt like, he didn't live up to what he wanted, but he gave people so much more than he could have, you know, ever imagined. Um, and I think that's a really interesting concept to look at. You know, what what you can actually do with what what your talent is, and how you can move people and touch people in certain ways that you wouldn't be able to. Um, and you know, if you don't meet your own standards, it's like that's okay. Like, look at how much good you can actually do. So if people are interested, do you you can go to the Kickstarter pre page. Is there anywhere else they can sign up, or where can they keep aware of the project? Yeah, so uh, you can uh, sign up to follow the the pre launch page there, uh, and it'll notify you. It'll send you an email uh, the moment that it launches on August second. Um, and so I would really encourage people to follow it. Uh, there's going to be some really great early bird rewards and some uh, exclusive stuff that you can only get on day one. Uh, so that's really exciting. Uh, we have about almost 100 followers uh, for the campaign page right now. So that's really cool. Uh, and I would love people to uh, you know check out my YouTube channel, uh, Foxhole Comics. I uh, reveal the different variant covers on my channel, and I talk about the story and the writing, and I do live streams. And I also have a series uh, called The Art of Writing Comics where I look at some of my favorite stories and uh, flip through them and walk you through them and, and talk about what I love about them. Um, so you can always keep updated, you know, with me on that. Uh, and of course on social media and all that. I'm sure you're aware of this. There are certain people that they're Indiegogo only or they're Kickstarter only. If, yeah. if, if this does well on Kickstarter, was there going to be another campaign on, on Indiegogo for, for latecomers? Probably. It's one of those things where I, it depends on how well the Kickstarter does. Yeah. And uh, I will say that um, there's going to be a lot of things missing if we move over to Indiegogo after the campaign is done for Kickstarter. So um, uh, I don't know exactly what all that will be, but um, by the time we get to Indiegogo, I, you know, I, I encourage people to, to mm -hmm. go to the Kickstarter first because um, I think that you're going to find a lot more uh, that that campaign has to offer. That's that's good stuff. Do you have anything else you want to say about Manchild, or you want to start talking? To, we got some viewer questions they've been waiting to, to ask. Oh yeah, no, I'd be I'd be fine with uh, with you know taking some questions. That's that's let's, great. Let's do some questions. I think these are mostly going to be. So this is this is Marigo, and she asked, "Did you did we cover how to show the impact of punches in a fight scene?" And we got to be kind of quick on this because uh, I actually have another thing I'm doing in 20 minutes. So, Mark, how do you okay. do an impact of punches? 
<laughs> impact of punches in a fight scene. I mean, just as, so as the writer, um, I just make sure that if the punch is important, uh, then it gets like a whole panel to itself. Like in Common America 3, um, that one, that one's been out for a while, so it's not really a spoiler. We have this fight scene at the end where Ver the villain Vermilion Masquerade is um, is attacking this warehouse that uh, the Common Core, the heroes, are in, and I made sure to put a really big emphasis on this um, punch that Vermilion does with her giant like mud monster hand. That um, it's it's on a page turn, so it's um, a surprise where it just knocks um, the character Sylvia across the room and really just lays her out. Um, and so I made sure to write that into the, the script that it, this is big, important punch. But we we'll also have another one um, a few pages later where Sylvia delivers a punch herself to uh, Vermilion, and it's um, one of the final blows that really uh, takes her down. Um, but then meanwhile, throughout the entire um, book, during all of our action sequences, there's lots of punching back and forth. But uh, we, those, those are happening in rapid succession in, in various panels and aren't the emphasis on the panels. If you want to have a punch that's really important, um, then you have to highlight that in your script and say, hey, this is a big dramatic moment. Um, give this punch a lot of spotlight and emphasis in the arts. Whereas if it's not in your script, you just put like, oh, characters punch and kick each other or whatever. <laughs> Jimmy from Comics Works wants to know how do we show love and hate in the same person at the same time? How do you do that with Nader? Oh man, that's actually with that's a, a, a great a, question. With a weird smile. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh there there are different ways I think you can go about that. I, I think, you know, let's say your character is, is fighting someone they don't want to fight. You know, maybe it's a loved one or, or someone they have to, you know, uh really engage in combat with. You can show the, the sadness and, and the love that they have for that character and the fact that they're doing this on their on their face while they are you know uh, punching them or, or taking them out and and you know you could show a tear you could show something that makes them go like oh man this is this is I hate that I have to do this right now and that I have to fight you um, and I think I think it really does depend on the kind of interaction you're having uh, with with a few characters. But um, also, uh, it can it can it can just be in a simple you know two to three panels of showing how someone reacts to you know something that's going on and how they are conflicted, and you can show that through expressions or you can show that through uh, you know them them looking at different memories or things that they've gone through with that character. Uh, there's a lot of really intricate details that you'd have to get into uh, with where that character is at mentally and what they can do and, and what that scene is. Yeah. You got to watch the Obi-Wan Anakin scene from uh, was that rise of, or the, what was the third one? In the, Re 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 yeah. You were the chosen <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> we got Varigo and here, uh, Mark, if you're writing a scene with animals fighting, how could you make it seem less restrictive in terms of what could happen as opposed to when humans fighting? You do a lot of animals fighting. What, what would you do? So one of the, our rules um, in Black Ops is that they aren't anthropomorphic animals. They um, can only utilize the anatomy of an actual rabbit or an actual otter. Um, so patriotter, otters have thumbs. So patriotter can um, wield small uh, firearms, but um, USAGI, who's a rabbit, cannot. Um, USAGI uh, can jump and hop around, um, and that allows him to move very quickly and be very agile. But um, if he wants to use a, his uh, combat knife, he has to carry it in his teeth because he has little paws. He doesn't have hands. Uh, it is restrictive on um, what you can do with their anatomy, but it's also um, it allows you to be creative, to think outside the box. And what kind of um, cool stuff can you do with these characters? You, If you research the animals and you kind of find out some of the... Uh, uh, unique things about them. Like I didn't know otters had, you know, prehensile hands until I started watching a bunch of otter videos and I could see them like picking <laughs> up the food like a raccoon. You know, raccoons technically don't have thumbs, but they have prehensile hands. They can pick up food and they can eat it like someone eating popcorn. And those videos are really funny. Like, oh, so we can do some stuff like that. Um, we haven't done it yet because we haven't had um, an opportunity to, but otters can actually swim in snow if the snow is loose enough, they can just like, almost like a snake, just like wiggle their way through snow. So that's something really fun that I put in the back burner that I want to do with Patriot or someday. Um, 
So basically, you're not really restrictive. Um, and same thing with like expressions on the characters. We do, we break the anatomy and that the characters can cartoonishly express themselves. So they can you know, they can smile and they can look scared and they can do these crazy uh, things with their faces. But uh, their their bodies and their postures and what they can do with their hands and their feet and such are, are strictly anatomical. Jimmy wants to know, Bendis does a time transition with it. He'll say 30 seconds ago, and then he'll have a full scene. It feels like a cheat. What do you think, Nander? <laughs> uh, man, I don't know. It's one of those things where I guess I would have to know the context of what is happening with that sequence or, or, or the scene. But um, I do think it's 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 an easy way out. Uh, you know, it, there, there are ways. It, it feels like a deadline decision. You know, like if, if you have to make a deadline and you're like, this is the first thought that comes to my mind. OK, I'm going to, you know, just put this here and that'll make sense and then I can move on. So I do think it, it could be used as a cheat um, unless, you know, maybe it's a very important sequence that in terms of the context of what's happening, you know, could be could be really valuable. Osmandius, I did it 20 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, that's what we talked about <laughs> earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if you're going to put just real, real quick to add on to that, if you're going to put a time limit on something, uh, you have to actually make sure that it, it can function within that time limit. You know, if, if yeah. uh, Frieza is going to blow up the planet Namek in five minutes, you can't have 20 episodes of him fighting Goku <laughs> with the planet not blowing up yet. <laughs> if you're if you have they have to defuse a bomb and there's only one minute on the timer, uh, read that scene back to yourself. And if you can't read that scene within one minute, then you're probably messing up somewhere. So if your um, Bendis style flashback says 30 seconds ago and like um, fit, the dude said, it, like it's a full scene that lasts more than 30 seconds, then it wasn't 30 seconds ago, was it? It was more like two minutes ago. Yeah. The worst countdown ever is in The Dark Knight Rises. There's no <laughs> reason for that thing to have that thing. He was going to blow it up anyway. Right? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. How do you properly mix slapstick and action? Now, is that for me or for Nander? It's got to be you. You write all the comedy stuff. I'm sorry, oh. Nander. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll give you the man-child question. That's the next one. <laughs> um, so for writing slapstick... Um, a lot of that is um, I, because I'm not the artist, uh, I'll use reference images. You know, if we have a character doing like a funny Pratt fall, um, there's a scene in, uh, what, what was it? What was it? Uh, I've done so many books lately. It was a character in Carly. That's right. It was in common America one. Um, there's going to be a, there's a funny scene where Carly's fighting Misha in, in the final act and she falls flat on her face out of the, out of the sky and had a very specific pose that I wanted her to be landing in because it'd be very funny physical comedy. And I, I wrote the description in the panel of like, okay, she's um, landed like on her, uh, her collarbone and her chin is, is like resting against the, uh, the dirt, but her, her spine is, is still sticking up and her legs are folded over herself and her arms are splayed out, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and I was like, I'm just going to go find a reference photo for this. <laughs> and so I went and I found, um, found like a, a screen cap from Thundercats where a Wiley kit lands like that. And so I, I just took a screen cap of that and I posted that and they're like, or just look at this reference photo. And Tim redrew everything, you know, in a different pose and different and freehand, a different angle. Um, but sometimes reference photos help a lot if you're doing visual comedy and you're the writer, not the artist, and you want to get the visuals across to your artist without um, losing anything in the transition um it's always okay to use reference photos all right tevya smoker wants to know the whole man child thing drives me insane because it's a common factor for speed spider-man peter park is that what you've seen nander yeah I, I i think i think some people have approached peter parker in, in a lot of you know uh, immature ways of, of using the character i mean uh you know it's it's different you know uh, reading Bendis Ultimate Spider-Man because, of course, he stays in high school and we see we see how Bendis writes him, uh, you know, as as a as a teenager. But also, um, you know, with with everything Peter's gone through, you know, uh, to to keep having him be so immature, uh, you know, it just doesn't really, you know, jive with with the character arc and everything that he's done. You know, uh, it, it's great to show character development and progression and Peter Parker is, you know, in a different place he is now than he, than he used to be, or he should be, you know, this 60 year old character. Yeah. <laughs> he should be a teenager anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. So this will be the final question. Uh, El Kemlosi. 
Any ideas or tips on writing mental, uh, mentally unstable characters, split personalities, voices in their heads? How would you do that, Nander? Uh, that's actually a really great question because uh, my uh, my main character in Seasons, uh, he's a very uh, analytical character. There's a lot of uh, inner dialogue and a lot of observations that he makes. And um, he also has this ability in the first book to uh, basically, he, basically an empath or someone that can uh, read other people's emotions, not necessarily their thoughts, but their emotions and what they're, what they're feeling and what's going on. And so... Um, a great way to do that, uh, I think, is to have very like frantic energy. So that can really come out in layouts and the amount of panels that you use, and also kind of cutting them up um, in very small panels. You know, if 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 a character if he's mentally unstable, the way that he views the world and the way that you can show that character view the world uh, can be broken up in very unstable ways. You can use layouts to really show the mental state of your character. Um, also, uh, you know, just using floating, you know, dialogue bubbles of other characters, uh, you know, thoughts and or the main character's thoughts and showing that uh, progress, you know, from from left to right and down and kind of zigzag it down, I think are great ways to uh, not only keep your reader, you know, engaged, but also uh, show just how much of a uh, frantic and unstable uh, mental state that that character's in. Um, so it really, I think, comes down to how you lay out a page. And uh, I'm 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 a stickler for layouts. I I lay out a lot of what I what I draw, and and of course, I mean what I write. And when I work with my artists, of course, we'll go back and forth on it. But I love as a writer uh, getting the best image I can in my head for that when I'm writing the script. Uh, just because it, you know it's a visual medium, it's like it, I want to I want to know what I'm going to see on that page, and then it helps me to be a better writer and to work with with artists and i would go back and go check out craven's last night you probably read it already go read that one again the mental instability in craven himself he is absolutely nuts and it's just getting worse as the comic book goes along and it's done very well in my opinion so that's going to do it on comics writing 101 i do want to say thank you to, to everybody that was here uh checking out the channel i think we had a good time also thank you very much to nander uh, of Fox Schaefer the first for showing up on the channel first time. And uh, sounds like man child is very exciting and we'll have you back again to talk about it once you launch the campaign. Oh yeah. Thank you so much guys. Uh, this has been such a joy and apologies for any technical difficulties on my end. Um, but I've had such an uh, incredible time and, uh, and I love doing this and yeah, I can't wait to be back. And thank you very much, Mark. We'll see Aaron again. It's his birthday. Hopefully he doesn't, Get hung over like you were today. Oh, my goodness. Well, if he does, I hope he can take Monday off. That's why I do it on Saturday nights. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll see you later. See you.